okay? Um, Rome. Start with a small city-state around Rome in the 8th century BCE. Uh, grow into a huge empire that include the entire Mediterranean. The Mediterranean Sea became the, um, you know, inside the lake for this huge empire. It basically conquered the entire um, Western world um, and, um, you know, the old civilizations we have been looking at so far were all incorporated into the huge Roman Empire. Um, the Mesopotamia, you know, Egypt, Greece, of course, and much more. So, um, that history was a long, turbulent history. Um, <clears throat> from the 6th century to the 3rd century, uh, Rome expanded to occupy much of the peninsula called Apennine Peninsula in central Italy, conquering the Etruscans, who used to be the majority uh, in Italy. And uh, during the so-called Punic War from 267 to 146 BCE, Rome conquered much of the northern bank of the Mediterranean Sea, as well as Tunisia. The Punic War was fought between Rome and Carthage, right? Tunisia back then was called Carthage. It was founded by the Phoenicians. Phoenicians was a people living in today's Palestine. Um, they were also sea people, much like the, Greece, uh, the Greeks, and they founded a very powerful kingdom there known as Carthage. So that war, over a century long, fought between Rome and Carthage. Eventually, the result was the victory of Rome. But of course, there was a lot of back and forth in between. The famous uh, Carthaginian general Hannibal um, once invaded Rome. Um, he made a surprise attack of Rome from north of the um, Alps, from north of the Alps, and that was a legendary uh, military um, expedition. Um, so, but uh, eventually it was Rome that won the war, and after that, uh, <clears throat> Rome became the dominating force in the entire Mediterranean region. Under Julius Caesar, much of northern um, Africa also became Roman province. And then um, Augustus, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, also made um, Egypt a province, basically ended the Ptolemaic um, Egypt, uh, which was founded by a general of Alexander the Great in the 4th century BCE. And um, in the year 27 BCE, Augustus, um, you know, after defeating the famous Cleopatra and Mark Anthony, um, he made Egypt a province of Rome. Um, under Emperor Trajan, in the um, first to second century CE, Rome reached its largest expansion. Uh, <clears throat> the British Isle, southern part, you know, England and Welsh, that part also became a, a province. And um, Emperor Hadrian built a great wall there, separating England from Scotland. So back then, England was part of the civilized, you know, in quotation mark, civilized world of the Romans and, um, you know, Scotland belong to uh, barbarians. So that was a very brief history 
Rome was big, and its arch architecture was also grand and big. But the most unique feature of Roman architecture is that it used a different material. The Roman architecture has a advantage of bricks. So they had they, uh, uh, they had bricks. They also had concrete. The Romans are this is the point I want to make are true builders. I have talked about that the Greeks, you know, they were more sculptors than builders. Their beautiful temple were carved out on the site. It was the sculpting um, that brought out the beauty of Greek architecture. And their marbles were custom-made quarried for specific location. But the Romans were very different. They were true builders. The, their approach to architecture is is 100% architectural. By architectural, I mean you have a bunch of standardized material and you find a way to um, assemble them and that is called a building, right? That's not sculpting. So the Romans use primarily stone, brick, and uh, concrete. This is an advantage that the Greeks didn't have. The Romans had access to the Pozzolana, um, po uh, Pozzolana uh, cement, which is a volcanic ash, right? A volcanic ash from Pozzolana, and um, and those ash, when you mix it with water, and aggregates, you know, small sand and and pebbles, um, after it. It is hardened. It is just as strong as stone. Right, that's concrete. Uh, the Romans had concrete. In another word, Roman architecture is wet masonry. The Greeks are, you know, dry masonry. The Greeks didn't use mortar. There is no mortar. Um, they use metal pin. They use kind of um, some sometimes mortise and tenon, but they didn't use mortar. But the Romans had concrete, so concrete cement also used as mortar to combine stone, and uh, then use it to form the majority of their structure. Different ways of um, using concrete had been um, invented in Roman architecture. Um, opus insertum, you know, refer to using irregular shaped um, stone to make the framing wall and fill in in between the concrete. So this kind of way of building a wall, it's much like some of the kind of ashlar um, walls, uh, cyclopean walls from Neolithic period where um, the Neolithic people use giant stone to create frame for thick wall and fill in debris, dirt, sand, pebbles, etc. That was, of course, had to be really thick to make the wall stand. But the Romans had concrete, they fill in concrete, and that could make wall actually thinner than pure um, masonry, you know, stone construction. So, opus insertum, the surface is irregular, even though they were flat, but the shapes were irregular. Opus reticulum, uh, uh, reticulatum, um, opus reticulatum, um, the stone surface were, were regular, often square in shape, but could be aligned diagonally, and uh, the pointed end inside of the wall made a more complete combination with the you know with the concrete so the inside it's it's just like the um mesopotamians um you know using of 
ceramic pin to protect their clay wall, right? So the inside is, is basically a, having those triangular side, um, which created greater surface for the two material to have a full combination. And then there is opus testisum, and um, that is using brick, right? Using those triangular brick to make the framing wall and fill in the and there is also um, opus um, mixtum. Uh, mixtum basically means you know you could use you 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 can combine brick and a stone to make the framing wall, but the core hidden material is concrete, and that is really structural. The main body. Um, so that's how they use this material, and. Um, so, the new material allowed the Romans to develop very thin shells uh, for structure and for dome. Um, and their bricks were also quite standardized. Um, they used standardized material. That's why I call them the true builder. They were mass produced. Uh, mass produced all in the size um, one and a half by one Roman foot. Um, and uh, the bricks were also printed with the maker's name and sign, so that whoever made a, you know, a, a disqualified uh, material could be held accountable. Um, so Roman architecture in very high quality um, and in very uh, kind of fast speed. Um, and the Roman wall, by the way, you know, the previous walls I just, just mentioned were not meant to be exposed and being appreciated as the architectural surface. Rather, they would dress them up with marble. So um, the Romans admire Greek culture, and they actually consider the Greek temples the most beautiful. And, um, you know, they had made great advance advancement in technology, however, it seems like they didn't approve that. He thought that's totally utilitarian. That's not art. That's not beautiful. Whatever is art and beautiful were the um, Greeks. They cover their innovation with a veneer of marble for those high-level architecture or stucco for the common, for the common folks to mimic an appearance of Greek architecture. So there is um, in architecture. Um, the conservative um, habit had always been, uh, you know, in force. There's always a tendency of doing, eating the past and uh, holding on to the tradition. And innovations in architecture were very often considered as ugly. Um, and that, you know, started as early as as a Roman time. Um, however, the technological innovation had a unstoppable power to create a new form. Because um, concrete as a material perform very differently than, um, say, post and lintel um, usage of stone or, or timber. Um, the Romans used the um, concrete to create arch and vault. All right, arch and vault was able to span a much wider distance than post and lintel, and that is a big advantage. So this kind of span was unthinkable in Greek architecture. You cannot put two columns and then put a lintel and uh, to span such a wide space. But for, um, for vault, that is possible. Because the vault uh, transformed stress into compression. So when 
a stone, a piece of stone is used in a post and lintel fashion. The top part, because and then when you add a load, the upper part of the the stone was in compression, because the stone after the load is going to curve down slightly, even if you don't notice it. So that curve would make the upper part in compression. That was no problem, but the lower part. Lower edge of the stone was was in you know extension, and that was no good for stone. Stone was not good at resisting pulling away forces. That that was the reason why stone cannot should not be used in the post and lintel fashion. The wood, on the other hand, was very good at doing that. They were good at resisting pulling away force. They were also、um, good at、um, resisting the、uh, compression. However, when you pile up stone like that, make them into an arch, all the stones were in compression. They were all there was no part of the stone that was being. Pulled away, and they were all pressing against one another, and that is what the material of stone was good at resisting. However, that created another problem. So you have so much internal compression. Eventually, as a complete arch, that force is going to show. There was a sideway. Uh, load. In addition to the downway load in arch, and this is this is something post and lintel doesn't have. For the post lintel structure, the lintel, the beam, only exert downward load. There is no sideway. Sideway load was zero. However, arches and vault. It has sideway load. That means you need to build a thick wall to resist that. In another word, when stones were built into an arch using blocks, the stone were not,、um, you know, were all in compression and、uh, very strong, without the danger of. Being pulled apart, however, the structure is like a spring. They had a tendency of, you know,、uh, spread out and collapse. So you have to build a thick wall, a buttress, to resist that. And、um, however, if you put one arch against another, then you don't have to build. You know, buttress for each and every arch, because that lateral thrust, lateral load, horizontal load, would be internalized. So this arch is going to provide counter force for that one, and you, all you need to do is to put a thick wall at the end of a series of of arches. And about. So, as a new structure, favored cellular、uh, design. That is, you know, you have a unit, and then you repeat it many, many times. And as a result, you only need to strengthen the end of that theory. So that structural system require new design, new form of plan, new form of architecture. So technology. Had always been a driving force behind the creation of a new architectural form. So one single、um, arch, if you repeat it and put them together, you create a vault. You create a tunnel, right? So that's called a vault. 
and it came from Latin, the Latin um, volvera, to roll or to turn, to turn about. So um, the Romans use vault, uh, like here in this case. There's a there's a vault. Um, so as a result, Roman architecture is composed of complex combination of simple units, and um, the structural um, principle also favors symmetry, because if you have symmetry, then the strengthening part at the end could be the same. It it created a very stable structure, and a geometrical order. So Roman architecture very different from uh, Greek architecture, featured axiality and uh, symmetry, use access to link a, a huge complex. And within that complex, you find a repetitive unit. And they were constructed with the arch and vault system, as well as dome and semi-dome. So when you line up an arch, you create a vault. But if you rotate an arch, you create a dome, right? You rotate an arch um, from a center, and then you create a dome. So Roman architecture had that great geometry, circular, square, and those circular ones were covered by dome and half dome. And they were usually uh, put there to create an end to a complex. Um, so the regularity, symmetry, and axiality of Roman architecture partially expressed the ideology of a centralized imperial government. On the other hand, it was more a result of the new kind of technology and a new material. A vault. There was a big disadvantage of a vault. That big disadvantage is you can only open at one end, right? For a vault like that, the light and the ventilation only come at the end. There is no possibility of open window on the side. Uh, that was a big disadvantage. However, if you cross two barrel vault, Right, that is called a barrel vault. You create a groin vault, and redu you reduce the supporting system to four spot instead of thick walls, and that is called the gro uh, groin groin vault, also known as cross vault. Right, groin vault, um, cross vault, the the same thing. It's created by um, intersecting two barrel vault so that all the four sides can be opened as window. Um, and reducing the support to uh, some giant piers. Right? You just need to strengthen the corner. You don't have to strengthen a whole wall anymore. And thus created a unobstructed interior space. So in that, in that way, you could create a large interior space. And uh, since the Roman time, that technology had been perfected more and more. And eventually, in Gothic architecture in the 13th century, the supporting the roof became so light, so those supporting pillars could be um, very thin, and creating those skeletal um, structures known as you know Gothic architecture. But that's later um, stories. So. Um, I mentioned that the Romans admire Greek architecture. So they dress up their concrete building with stone um, veneer. And uh, this is the way they decorate their building. It is redundant structurally, right? So um, the vault was already making sufficient support for the ceiling. You don't need that post and lintel anymore. So that Greek order was pure decorative. There was no no need, no function whatsoever. That's just a decoration. But the Romans 
um, like to you know decorate um, embellish their building using Greek um, order and um, as a result they created pilasters and engaged columns um, engaged columns refer to something like this. The columns were still kind of semicircular, looks like a column. Um, but the pilaster are usually just a low relief, um, just a square relief to delineate a column, a capital, an entablature, you know, frieze and um, architrave, cornice, um, etc. Um, basically, engaged columns are more three dimensional and um, high relief and the pilasters are more two-dimensional just slightly elevated from from the ground the Romans um, invented two more orders to the Greek orders in Greek architecture we have the Doric we have the Ionic we have the Corinthian and for the Greeks the Corinthian was considered a um, variation of Ionic. Um, the Romans added two at the end, at each end. One is super simplistic, even more simplistic than Ionic. It's basically a, a unfluted um, Doric, I'm sorry, Doric, right? Um, so it's even simpler than the simplest Greek order. Well, the other is more complicated than the most complicated Greek order, and that is called composite. Composite is basically adding a Ionic volute on top of a Corinthian order and created that super fancy um, capital. Um, another major difference is the Romans like standardization they didn't like those kind of exception. We know that in Greek architecture, Ionic order has base, Doric order has no base. But the Romans really didn't like that kind of exception. They made them all uniform. They all have capital, shaft, and a base. The Doric also has a base in much the same way as others. The only difference became the capital for Roman orders. So Romans really take the order and develop it into a decorative means. It became decoration. Um, classical order in Greek architecture refer to a comprehensive design. It has something to do with the plan. It has something to do with proportion. It has something to do with everything. It was not just to the column, not just to the capital. While the Romans really made those order just a decoration. It has nothing to do with plan. It has nothing to do with, um, had very little to do with proportion. You know, all those, you know, the, those different kind of entablature, they all have very similar uh, proportion. Um, and uh, the, the, there was also little difference in the base. And plinth. The key difference is just the capital. Right? So order in Roman architecture is decorative, but in Greek architecture it's a comprehensive architectural design. Now we will look at, you know, the Romans um, had some kind of new um, invention in, in, architect in terms of architectural typology. They inherited something from the Greeks, like the temple. The Romans also built temple. That is probably the least innovative Roman architectural type. But they also invented something really uniquely Roman. One is basilica. Taking advantage of concrete and a new structure, the Romans built columnless interior, large interior space called basilica. It was used for civic purposes, for court and assembly, and uh, the emperor held office, held, you know, uh, meeting um, in basilica. 
Same as the provincial authority, they also had basilica for administrative purposes. That is something we will look in some detail. The Romans also built um, architecture for entertainment. They create the inherited theater, but transformed it, it into a unique Roman type. And then they combine theater into amphitheater. And that is a unique Roman type. And then the care for the body, the Romans built big bath, bath complex known as thermi. Um, that's a unique kind of Roman type. So these Roman architecture, just like the Greek, Greek architecture of Agora, Stoa, Temple, that were used to spend the Greek civilization during the Hellenistic period and during the Hellenization colonization of the Mediterranean, the Romans also use architecture to establish colony and to establish cities in the conquered land and to declare, after rebuilding the area, declare them as civilized, no longer barbarian. Tacitus commented on the Romanization of Britain. For example, he said, um, he the governor of Britain, who was, of course, a Roman, would assist communities to erect temples, forums, houses. Moreover, he began to train the sons of the chieftains in a liberal education and to give a preference to the native talents of the Britain. As a result, the nation which used to reject the Latin language began to aspire to rhetoric. Further, the wearing of our dress became distinction, became a distinction, and the toga came into fashion. And little by little, the Britons were seduced into alluring vices. To the lunch, the bath, the well-appointed dinner table, the simple natives gave the name of culture to fact of their slavery. So architecture, performed a very significant function in conquest and in, in the civilization of the Western world. Um, that civilization, of course, um, was preceded by bloody and, uh, um, you know, um, bloody fight and, uh, and a conquest. So let's first take a look at, at temple. Um, before became, becoming an empire, the Romans had their own temple. Their own temple um, was usually constructed in wood, right? Wooden construction. And their temple had a rear um, room and with a porch in the front. So the Roman architecture in, in Roman temple um, their column is pro style, pro style column, pro style porch, pro style. Let me see if I have yeah, pro style. Pro style is a Greek Greek architectural term. Means, um, you know, the columns are just in front, not all the way around. And peristyle is the uh, typical Greek temple, um, like in Parthenon, that the columns. Um, goes all around the cella. So this is the layout of Greek temple. It's always obviously a peristyle. This is the layout of Etruscan temple. It's a pro style. And um, <clears throat> while Greek temple could be accessed from all direction, it doesn't matter which way you approach the temple. You can come from the back, come from the front, come from the side, and you enter the same porch and you circulate it and you enter from the end right the entrance was not specifically marked on the facade of a greek temple however um you know the previous etruscan temple which was a the ancestor of roman temple um had a um front right there's a, unmistakably a front with only one flight of steps that the only way you can ascend 
the platform, and the other sides are side and back, right? You don't want to go approach the temple that way. Roman temple, on the other hand, uh, combined the two. The very often the spatial layout was still pretty much Etruscan and Roman with a strong axis, an unmistakable front, and a, a, an actual kind of pro style layout. However, engaged columns were um, put on the wall, so from appearance it looks like a peristyle. And that is the temple of Mason Carey in Nîmes, France. It was built in 16 BCE. It was built by Marcus Agrippa, um, the son-in-law, uh, uh, the son-in-law of Julius Caesar. And um, um, you know he was a very capable guy. Uh, I'm sorry, Augustus, um, Octavia, Augustus the son-in-law of uh, Augustus Octavius, um, the successor of Julius Caesar. He sponsored a lot of architectural project, theaters in Rome, as well as the famous Pantheon. So that's all this guy. Um, so that Mason Carey commemorating Agrippa's dead sons uh, was built combining the Greek appearance with an Etruscan and Roman kind of spatial layout, right? Engage the column to create an illusion of peristyle, but, you know, spatially um, and architecturally, it is actually a pro style. You can only approach from the front to the porch. Um, Another major difference, while the Greeks prefer um, rational design following module, following a you know, stable ratio, but the Greeks didn't really pin down what ratio you should use, right? Like the um, Parthenon, its ratio, the, uh, the, 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 the standard ratio is 9 to 4. The Romans, on the other, other hand, prefer something, um, some ratio, specific ratio. They like square, they like um, proportion like 1 to 2 or 2 to 3. Um, they wouldn't build something that is 9 to 4. They also like circle, geometry. Uh, Mason Carey, for example, um, for the temple at large, the proportion is 1 to 2. The width and the length is basically 1 to 2. So you fit 2 square in its plan. What's more, on the facade, from the base of the column to the edge of the cornice is also a square. 1 to 1 proportion. So um, unlike the Greeks, the Romans like to build in a specific ratio, not just consistent, but consistent among different building. And those are using um, whole numbers proportion. Um, and they especially consider square and a circle as the ideal that geometry, square and circle, almost had a sacred um, symbolic meaning for Roman architecture. So that's another kind of major difference. Uh, but the Roman architecture didn't have that subtle um, kind of a uh, treatment. Um, they, they didn't have um, emphasis. Um, you know, the straight line did not curve up um, in those kind of very subtle way. Um, and, um, and their temples were constructed with standardized material. Now, basilica, 
this is a Roman uh, innovation. Um, during the Republican period of the Roman history, most basilicas were constructed in wood. But during the imperial period, that is after um, Augustus in the late first century BCE, more and more masonry basilica were constructed. Basilica was used for assembly, court, and business. So it's a, a secular building. It's basically a rectangular hall with timber roofs rest on rows of internal columns. And uh, it could be likened to an inverted Greek temple, while the Greek temple use a peristyle column to encircle a cell, a walled room. The Romans use walled huge hall to enclose an internal peristyle. Um, and such a rectangular hall um, often, you know, hold the statue of the emperor at one end, at the short end. And that is also the place where the um, officials held office. You have a court hearing, you have a statue of the emperor in the back, and the, um, the magistrate um, or other high officials sit here, or even just emperor himself in, in the city of Rome and have a, a hearing with an audience or um, subjects. So it had that direction. It favored one direction. The previous location for a statue of Athena or other Greek god now was substituted with the statue of the emperor. But um, the, the Roman basilica, for the Roman basilica, the entrance could be at the op opposite end of the statue could also be on the side. It all depends on how um, the basilica is related to the neighboring buildings. Um, it depends on the context. Um, some basilicas were entered from the side, the main entrance, some from the, the opposite end of the uh, statue. And very often at the statue side, um, after, during the imperial period, a kind of a Exedra or semicircular space would be constructed, topped by a, a semi uh, dome, right? That kind of circular space. Um, later, when the Christians adopted the basilica for the building of church and the cathedral, they would make the entrance exclusively from the short side, um, and the statue of the emperor would be substituted by a cross um, of crucifixion um, with, you know, Jesus um, and the cross. Um, and the desk for the magistrate would be re replaced by uh, the altar. But that's, you know, later, later story. So that's the Basilica. And um, um, the Basilica of Maxentius started with emperor called Maxentius, but completed by Constantine. Uh, Constantine defeated Maxentius and became the sole emperor of the entire Roman Empire and completed the project not, not finished by his uh, competitor and predecessor. So it was a fourth century, early fourth century uh, CE um, building and it is pure masonry, and it used um, concrete to create um, the vaults for the roof. Uh, but it has the same kind of spatial arrangement as the timber um, basilica from the Republican period. Um, it has a central bay. Later, this would be called the nave. And then the two sides, separated by the columns, those would be referred to as the aisles, right? And um, for the 
three central bays, groin valves were used. Um, because you know here you you really cannot cannot really um, use the barrel valve because the barrel valve won't open up to four direction. You know, like in the central bay, you wanted to open up to all the four direction. Only groin valve could reduce the load to the four corner. So the central bay groin valves were used, but side bay the um, um, barrel valves were used because the doorway inside of the aisle are very small and they could be opened very low and won't harm the structural stability of the side of the wall of the very thick wall right so the the arches runs that way so you line up a bunch of arches that way and you create a barrel vault so today um, the central bay and one side of the aisle collapsed, only one aisle survived. So you can see here we have this barrel vault, right? Barrel vault for this side. And that tiny little doorway uh, wouldn't harm the structural stability of this barrel vault because that wall is, is so, so thick. But for the um, central bay, um, the openings were very big. So groin vault had to be, to be used. And a, a close-up view of this survived aisle with those barrel vault. And they use this um, kind of a decorative motif uh, to dress up the ceiling to avoid those kind of um, large area of unembellished surfaces. And you can see the sides of this doorway are pretty small. So that still hold up that barrel vault. So groin vault for the center and a barrel vault for the side. And then at the end we have the exedra or semicircular space and that would held the statue of Constantine, Emperor Constantine. He had a giant statue seated there. Today, you know, um, the head and the some fingers have survived, which were, um, you know, huge. <clears throat> this is a reconstruction drawing showing the original interior of the Basilica of Maxentius and uh, the central uh, axiality targeting that exedra covered by a semicircular dome and the statue of Constantine, um, and on the side, those barrel vault, right? So. Christians, Christianity would later adopt basilica type for their church. So this interior looks very similar to St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. Um, St. Peter's looks almost exactly like this, um, the, uh, just substituting the statue with a crucifixion and an altar. <clears throat> now Roman theater, Roman theater also built upon the Greek type. However, Roman theater did not rely on um, a natural slope anymore. The Romans built a semicircular wall to enclose the entire audience seat. So it could be constructed in independent. And secondly, the circular um, orchestra in Greek theater was replaced by a semicircular orchestra. And this already happened in the Hellenistic period but the Romans made that even stronger, made the combination even stronger. In Greek architecture, um, the audience seat, the orchestra, and the scenic building, the scenia, were three independent buildings just loosely assembled 
to create a complex. But in Roman architecture, though the three parts were integrated within a common wall, right? So this is the audience seat, now very geometric, semicircular, and a semicircular orchestra, and the senior or the scenic building with its proscenium, which now became the performing stage, became a standard slab and integrated with the whole structure. Now, without attaching to a hillside and also with a full combination of audience with the senior building, there was no entrance in between audience now came from behind. So the audience and the performer, their roots were separate. The audience came from back of the seat and the actors and the performers and the elite audience came from the side of the, uh, the, the senior. So, um, it's more integrated, all right? So it became a um, pure human construction. And that allowed the Roman theater to be constructed in the very center, center of the city um, <clears throat> and um, does not rely on a slope or a hill. So this is um, Marcellus Theater. It was able to hold for 11,000 spectators. The entrance was from the back. And um, the central activity also shifted from the orchestra to the senior, to that um, proscenium, proscenium stage, right? That became the main performing stage. If you combine two theater face to face and eliminate the senior building, you create an amphitheater. So this is an amphitheater. It's basically like a stadium. Um, you know, you just uh, build two theater but erase that central senior. You don't need that. Um, just a central circular um, platform. That is an that is an amphitheater. <clears throat> the Romans created, built many amphitheaters. The most famous is the Flavian Colosseum. That is built in the Flavian dynasty, and. Uh, uh, completed under Emperor Titus. So that amphitheater, different from theater, theater is for the performance of, you know, tragedy, comedy, uh, etc. Rely on music, dance, and um, action. While amphitheater were f usually for uh, competition, those brutal, bloody um, kind of sports known as monas, that is the human sacrifice, or gladiatorical matches. Uh, two warriors fight with, with one another to one of them's death. And the Venetians, that is animal sacrifice, um, or, you know, a gladiator fighting an animal. So that is for that, you know, we call it, we can call it a support, but it's a, it's a very, you know, brutal sport. Um, the Flavian Colosseum was enormous, um, was huge, and um, It was capable of staging large-scale um, Venetian and Munas 
For example, 5,000 beasts were killed in a single day of the inauguration of the Colosseum by Emperor Titus in the year 80 CE. Under the central stage was a big foundation and um, basement where the beasts um, and the slaves, gladiators, could be in jail or you know held in their position, waiting for their turn, turn to climb up the stair and appear from one of those gate on stage to fight. So underground there was also a huge space. Now let's take a look at the structure of the Colosseum. Structurally, it is actually very simple. Very, very simple. Um, as long as you have the right material and the right structural system, it was basically a series of uh, barrel vault. Like this is a barrel vault. You know, my drawing was not that precise, but you can see that wall, you know, that wall and its extension and that wall create a barrel vault. It's basically a barrel vault. And the um, arches go in that way. Right? So basically, a series of barrel vault, in total, 80 of them. 80 barrel vault, but this barrel vault to create a, a oval shape, a circular shape. The barrel vault needs to be expanding toward the edge. So in another word, um, the arches at this end are smaller in span, and the arches at the outer edge are bigger. So you have, it's like, um, you know, the slice of a pizza, that kind of barrel vault, right? Okay, that's, a, of course, a curve, right? Curve. Um, and that's it. That's basically its structure. When you need an internal circulation, when you, you need a passageway, so if it's pure barrel vault, of course, that would make the space impossible to use. That means that there are walls obstructing, um, you know, just make them into uh, 80 small, tiny, narrow space is, is of no use. So when you need a passageway, you add a circular barrel vault and you create groin vault, right? So here, for example, we want a passageway, go all the way around, then make a circular barrel vault to intersect with those radial barrel vault and create groin vault. So these, these are groin vault. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, so the eight, there's 80 arcades, and the arcades are like the vaults on the outer ring of the amphitheater, right? Mm -hmm. So they're like, they look like windows. So why are there 76 entrances but 80 arcades? Um, 80, 80 arcade. Um, the seven, four of, four of them are not opened as entrances. Um, so there are 80 arcade and 80 wall because you know the the um uh, the head meet tail so for example if you want you know if you are just having a linear um arcade you know you have a three arcade you would need four wall right uh, but for for colosseum the head and the tail they meet so you have 80 arcade you just need 80 wall and okay. the 76 entrances are just referring to the entrance to, um, you know, some of them were, were blocked to, to have access to the seats.
And did the Flavian Colosseum have um, arcades on the upper floor as well? So um, yes, an they are. So basically, um, that's a great question. So you, you, yeah, well, you, you need to pile up those you need to pile up those um, vault one on top of the other. So this is the first floor, right? And then the second floor, you just need, you just uh, build that part. And the third floor, you just build that part. So that's was basically- there, Was this for decoration then? Because no. you can't, and it wasn't? No, it's, it's a structural. These are, oh, okay. these are structural. So um, it has it has a three structural floors. Uh, that means basically, you know, you have you need um, say this is the the first the the lowest um, you know radio barrel vaults, and this is the second. Okay. And then this is the third. All right. All right. Yeah. So this is like the here, you, you know, the center, of course, it does not, it does not meet in the center because, you know, if you extend this, it meet here. So it's not like, um, you know, one perfect circle. Um, and it, it does not need to because that the, um, you know, the span of the end, um, end arch is not a zero, right? So it's, they are not meeting in the, in the same center. So this half meet at, at here. And that half meet there. Mm, and, okay. uh, so that's basically how it. That's a great question. Thank um, you. Yeah. So, so basically, this is the um, the lowest lower floor, and then the upper floor, and then the third floor. So, um, so here is the location of the groin vault, right? But all the other space, these are the barrel vault. You know, the arch just rise that way you know, in, in that direction. Oh. So, um, so this is the uh, outer um, porch, right? The, the groin vault, um, that part, basically, that circular. So it has two outer circle and a few inner groin vault circles. So the structure was um, constructed, constructed in concrete, but then dressed up with with marble, with stone veneer, to mimic Greek, um, Greek architectural orders, and uh, those beautiful marble. After the fall of the Roman Empire, those beautiful marbles were taken away, to build a Christian, church and a cathedral during the medieval period. So today, all those marbles are gone, and we have the skeleton, and um, um, it is still quite fantastic. So this would be originally how it look, right? From outside, these are the three primary layers, and the upper part there's no slope, there's no um, you know structural uh, sloping anymore. It's you know that part is is just creating a upper end of the wall. So originally, Greek orders were applied to the concrete core. And statues, uh, you know, grace those arches. And the Romans used different order for different layer. For example, the um, lowest one, they use Tuscan order, the most simplistic, but also the most robust, looks the strongest without those delicacies. And the second floor, they use Ionic order. And the third floor, the use, now you can guess, right, Corinthian, um, became slenderer and slenderer, um, proportionally seems taller and taller. And the lower three floors are engaged column, which means their columns are semicircular in section. And the fourth layer of the wall uh, is just a pilaster. So it was not round, it's just slightly elevated um, from the wall, just uh, creating those lines to delineate a pilaster Corinthian. 
and its proportion is even slenderer than the third level. So the Romans started to develop this kind of a, um, aesthetic to create a sense of going, going lighter and lighter, right? 